Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Lauren O'Brien. I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Science Interactive, and I'm thrilled to be kicking off today's event. First, you'll see a poll that shows up on your screen. We would love if you could take a moment to respond to that as we're waiting for everybody to join today's event. Also want to mention just a few quick housekeeping items. One is that we are recording today's presentation um, and we'll send that out to everybody following the event. Uh, we're also gonna have time for Q&A. So I know the presenters are really looking forward to answering your questions. You can submit those at any time by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll be taking those as we get to the end of the presentation. Um, so I am thrilled to announce our main host and moderator for today, Dr. Caitlin Rooney Jancy, the Chief Academic Officer at Science Interactive. Kate, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren, and welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have you here. Um, so it looks like our poll just got launched, so we're going to give you a second um, to let us know how would you describe your institution's level of interest in online STEM, um, and we'll give you just a couple of minutes to answer that. Okay. And why don't we, looks like things are trickling in. Let's see how that came out. So um, what we're seeing here um, is that uh, roughly half of you um, have seen increased interest in offering STEM online at your institution with another third um, seeing the same level of interest, which is awesome. We're really excited to hear that. Um, we're gonna do one more poll um, before we get started. And we're really interested in understanding um, uh, where um, you're hearing um, the interest in um, bringing STEM courses online. Who are the primary driving forces behind the shift? Is it the instructors who wanna teach more courses online, um, leadership who want um, to increase offerings through mandates or strategic initiatives, or students? We'll give you a couple seconds to answer that. Okay, and it looks like we're slowing down, so let's go ahead and close that. Wow, and it's roughly uh, about an equal split, interestingly, between leadership and students um, with a small portion of instructors. So thank you all for sharing that. Um, as Lauren mentioned, my name is Kate Runny Janzi. I am the Chief Academic Officer here at Science Interactive Group. Um, I have been working in bringing um, lab, lab courses online for the last eight years, um, both in authoring and now in the larger strategic initiatives um, at our company. And I'm so excited to um, introduce my two co-hosts today. First, uh, Bethany Simonich. Uh, Dr. Bethany Simonich is the Vice President of Innovation and Research at Quality Matters, an educational nonprofit dedicated to ensuring online quality for all students. Previously, she's held roles in on-campus and online teaching, instructional design, faculty development, and also institutional administration for online learning. She's the co-director of the Changing Landscape of Online Education Survey Report, or CHLOE for short, um, which represents the perspectives of chief online learning officers across the company. Uh, the second uh, member of our panel joining us today is Dr. Carl Bailey. Uh, he earned a PhD in marine natural products from UC Davis in 2001. After his postdoc, he went right into college teaching at California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo, uh, developing integrated curriculum for the studio classroom environment. He joined Clark College in 2006, um, where his primary teaching focus since 2016 has been in pre-health professions uh, chemistry, um, specifically general organic and biochemistry. All of his courses are quality matter certified, and he has served in various roles at his institution, leading equity-based reforms across the college to support STEM identity, student success, and retention. He actively works to address and close equity gaps within his courses. So um, to get things started today, we have three primary sections where we'll be presenting insights from the CHLOE 8 report um, with Bethany. We'll then be discussing the results of the first annual lab report, um, which was put together uh, by the Science Interactive team to really dive into the latest research on online STEM education, specifically laboratory courses. 
From there, Carl will discuss overcoming common challenges in online STEM courses. And then we'll have a broader discussion for key strategies for delivering STEM courses effectively online. And of course, anytime throughout, uh, please feel free to add questions through the Q&A or through the webinar chat, and we'll be happy to answer them either in real time or at the end of the conversation. With that, I'm going to hand things over to Bethany uh, to discuss some insights from the CHLOE 8 report. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I appreciate it. So we're going to talk a little bit about some data that we've been seeing. As Caitlin mentioned, this is from the CHLOE report, the changing landscape of online education. So this is the perspective of chief online learning officers at higher ed institutions across the country. A lot of the data I'm going to talk about here in just a minute is from our most recent report, CHLOE 8, which was released in August. There's a nice uh, shortened link there if you'd like to download it, but I'm also going to bring in some uh, graphs from CHLOE 7. We're currently working on CHLOE 9, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's a year of project. All right, next slide, please. So speaking of CHLOE 7, I wanted to kind of ground this little section in talking about how we are seeing an increased interest in online, and a lot of it was spurred by the pandemic. So this is some, some data from CHLOE 7. We asked chief online learning officers about their experience in fall 2021 and whether or not they were seeing increased student interest across those student demographic populations you see there at the bottom, traditional age undergraduates, adult undergraduates, and also graduate students. And as you can see across the board, they reported, um, you know, majority said either a bit higher or much higher interest in terms of uh, uh, students, you know, really asking for more online options. Next slide, please. And then we saw that continue in Chloe 8 as well. So this is uh, the same perspective from 2022 here. I, I focused the graph here just looking at undergraduates. So what we're seeing here is not just an interest that is continuing to increase, but it's really that sustained interest. So for, for a number of years now, student interest in online institutions offering online has been ticking up a little bit uh, more quickly than on-campus offerings, but the pandemic really just kind of exploded that. I think a lot of students saw that online was an option for them when we experienced that remote learning during the pandemic. And so we are seeing this sustained and slightly increasing interest from students. Next slide, please. We also asked chief online officers last year in CHLOE 7 to kind of, you know, do some forecasting and make a prediction what they saw, you know, that, that typical campus experience to be like by 2025. And the major standout data point here, I think, yet again, is the, that traditional undergraduate market. So you can see there that 44% of chief online learning officers said that by 2025, traditional age undergraduates are going to still have majority on campus learning, but some online. 40% said it's going to be almost a balanced experience. So this is a much different picture um, than we were painting, you know, five years ago, even 10 years ago. You're seeing that again and again, traditional age undergraduates are, are expected to and currently are incorporating more online learning into their curriculum, a lot of it for flexibility reasons. But you can also see their adult undergraduates, the, the market and the demand is going to be rising for that as well as predicted by our, our senior online leaders. And of course, that graduate market, no surprise, they're going to be shifting. It's predicted to even greater online involvement. In terms of how are institutions meeting this demand, so this is from Chloe 8, I think the biggest takeaway here is most institutions are saying we need to offer our students flexibility in terms of that learning modality. 41% said their top priority is fully online equivalents of face-to-face -face courses. You know, obviously when you're thinking about that and how, are, how you're going to have the same options or additional options for students online than you do on campus, that's when you get into these great dis the discussions about, well, how does that curriculum really work online? And I think that is a good place uh, to start the discussion for hands-on and virtual labs in the online environment. You can see second priority there, pretty much uh, closely tied with new fully online courses, high flex versions of existing on-campus courses, as well as hybrid equivalents of existing face-to-face -face courses. So no matter how you look at this data and parse this out, you're seeing that campuses are really offering online modality options because students are demanding them and they're continuing to fill those sections in many cases before they fill those on-campus sections. Next slide, please. 
And then rounding this out to start to look about, you know, adoption, especially in virtual labs. So we asked about the technology that they were using, uh, whether it was across the institution or in specific programs and departments. I think no surprise here when you look at that virtual labs and simulations column there, 62% of senior online leaders said that there's a huge increase in this in specific programs and departments. I think that makes sense. You probably wouldn't see institution-wide adoption because obviously not all classes have virtual labs, but that's a huge increase just within those programs and departments. Next slide, please. And then looking at not just at the course level, but the program level, what enrollment shifts were chief online officers seeing? Um, fully online programs and blended hybrid programs were seeing in terms of growth or strong growth far outpacing their on-campus counterparts. So students are not just looking for discrete online courses. They're starting also to ask about fully online degree programs. This is for traditional age undergraduate. We did ask about the, the other student demographics as well, but I think this is this again supports you know all the data that we're seeing that students are gravitating towards these more online options for a lot of reasons. Cost might be one of them as well. But again, the, the growth here in, in fully online and hybrid for traditional age undergraduates is something that institutions should be discussing in terms of their strategy. Next slide, please. And in terms of those online programs and how institutions are meeting, again, this increased demand that they're seeing and predicting, adding new online programs based on student demand, that was the top response there by chief online officer, 66%, also looking at in-demand degrees. So again, this just further supports that we're going to have to serve students in different ways and offer options for, for modality, especially if we want to continue to increase enrollment and serve students in the best way that we can. Next slide, please. And I wanted to leave you with just one uh, free resource here. So if you're thinking about quality and designing your online and hybrid courses, this is a free resource that Quality Matters provides. It is publicly available to anyone. There's a nice shortened link there for you, but it's called the Bridge to Quality Design Guide. And it's really designed to help to take you in a very faculty friendly way from where you are now to help you focus on some course improvements that you feel would be most meaningful for you and your students. So wanted uh, to share that so you could check it out. And I'm gonna turn it back to you, Caitlin, thank you. Thank you, Bethany, so much for sharing all of that um, just really interesting data coming out of the Chloe report. And I know I'm so excited to see what comes next year as we move towards Chloe 9. If you were interested in reading more in depth of the Chloe 8 um, survey and report, um, we put the link in the webinar chat. So be sure to check that out there. Um, next, I am really excited to share with you uh, the data that came from our first annual lab report, um, which we performed here at Science Interactive throughout this fall. Um, uh, we, in we interviewed or, or surveyed um, over 1,600 students and instructors. And before we dive into things, um, we wanted to go a little bit into the demographics of the folks we spoke to um, as part of the survey. So in terms of the students, we spoke to just, just shy of 1,300 students, 92% of which had were either currently taking an online science course or had taken one within the last year. And of that group, 54% um, represented science majors. So we had roughly um, half, half science majors and half non-majors. Um, in terms of instructors, we uh, interviewed three or uh, surveyed th 321 instructors 78% uh, were adjuncts or tenured instructors, and just shy of 10% were deans or department chairs. Um, in terms of the courses that our instructors were teaching, 30% uh, taught majors-based courses, uh, just shy of 40% were teaching non-majors, and 30%, 32% um, were teaching a mix of both. When we surveyed our students and instructors, we know that many uh, teach multiple courses online, so we asked them to reflect on the most recent course they had either taken as a student or that they had uh, taught as an instructor. Um, and we took a look at what disciplines uh, were best represented and very interesting, it was the same amongst students and instructors um, with anatomy and physiology, biology, chemistry, and microbiology uh, representing the top four disciplines um, in the survey. So to start, the first thing we asked our students was whether it was important for them to be able to take a science course online. Um, and a whopping 91% of the students 
um, did respond that it was very important to them to, to be able to take a science course online as part of their um, course of study. And two of the quotes we included here are just really impactful about how um, being able to have um, online programs was essential to giving the students the opportunity um, to take to, to, to pursue either a STEM degree or pursue their program with a STEM requirement. Um, really honing in on rural students and students who uh, just can't get to campus because um, they are working or have childcare or uh, elder care responsibilities. We then asked um, students and instructors, you know, how satisfied were they with their online lab experience? And across multiple modalities, so both virtual, hands-on, and hybrid, which we consider uh, courses that use a mix of hands-on and virtual labs, as well as across majors and non-majors, we found that overall students and instructors were very satisfied um, with their online laboratory experience. Um, so just asking them about overall satisfaction, 81% of students and 78% of instructors were satisfied. 81% um, of students and 74% of instructors found that the labs made their course more engaging. And then 84% of students and 80% of instructors found that the labs that the students performed online um, gave students the opportunity to learn uh, the knowledge and the skills they needed uh, to pursue uh, the next courses within um, their educational career, whether as a major or non-major. As part of this, students really highlighted how online labs built engagement within their course. Um, they highlighted the benefits of being able to repeat experiments in a low stakes environment, um, to really have an immersive learning experience um, in their home, even though they couldn't get to campus to take the course, um, that the online labs really allowed them to engage more deeply with the course content and interact with the materials that they uh, would have been able to uh, interact with on campus. And it also supported them in feeling like they could study at their own pace, um, that the, the, virtual, the virtual or the hands-on lab kits at home really allowed them uh, to feel supported within their own learning style. Um, so really important to, to, for the students who are online to have that ability to engage with science at a, at a, a greater depth. We then asked our instructors, um, you know, what challenges did they face um, when bringing their laboratory courses online? It was very interesting to see um, that 41% um, of instructors felt that recreating that hands-on lab experience um, was the biggest challenge when bringing a lab course online. Um, really in understanding how to translate what so many of us have only ever experienced in an on-campus environment to a student who won't have an instructor to sit there side by side. Um, as they're working. Um, next, uh, the biggest concern was ensuring the quality and rigor of the course materials, followed by addressing issues with academic integrity. Instructors also in, um, cited promoting student engagement, ensuring lab safety and um, course materials meeting lab accessibility requirements. We then tried to dig into um, the differences uh, between uh, hands-on lab kits used at home um, as well as vir versus virtual simulations of labs. And so when we asked instructors what their preferred format for teaching an online lab course, um, just about 50% responded that a mix of virtual and hands-on labs done at home were the preferred manner to teach uh, students remotely. Um, just shy of 30% preferred only hands-on labs done at home. And then um, about 15% reported that virtual labs were their preferred method. We then dug into why some instructors selected virtual lab format rather than a hands-on lab format. Um, and most cited, the most cited that um, ease of implementation was the number one concern here, uh, followed by cost and then requirements by their institution. Uh, uh, instructors also noted that in some cases, the virtual labs paired with their textbook, as well as safety concerns of performing labs at home. However, um, there were both benefits and sh uh, shortfalls to using virtual labs at home. In terms of the benefits, um, instructors cited uh, the ability for students to observe the unobservable for reactions that might be too hazardous perform to perform at home. Um, there may be um, activities where the equipment is too expensive that students can't get it into their home or even onto campus in many cases. It also allows students to balance the cost of the course it supplements learning for repeatability, so students are able to repeat the experiment multiple times. 
It's a low stakes environment, once again, related to the fact that students are able to repeat on the activity, as well as supporting different um, learning uh, styles. However, when we asked instructors how they felt um, about the use of uh, virtual simulations, 82% of instructors and then 74% of students felt that they would have learned more using a hands-on lab kit in place of the virtual simulations. We then tried to dig deeper into how online labs compare to face-to-face -face labs. Um, so we asked instructors who had taught um, virtual with virtual simulations, and then we asked instructors and students who had taken courses with hands-on labs, you know, how did these compare to an in-person lab experience? Um, and it was very interesting to see um, where students and instructors differed here. When we asked the cohort that had taken virtual simulations in their course or had instructed using virtual simulations, 72% of students felt that the virtual simulations were comparable to an in-person lab experience. However, 68% of instructors disagreed um, and said it was not comparable. Um, in contrast, when we uh, dug into uh, uh, instructors and students who had used hands-on labs, um, both students and instructors agreed that the hands-on lab kits at home were comparable to an in-person lab experience. Um, we wanted to find out one of the biggest concerns that comes up with hands-on lab kits um, is the cost of those kits for the students. So we asked both the instructors and students whether the cost of the hands-on lab kit was aligned with the value of the materials or the value of being able to do hands-on experiments. Among instructors, 68% agreed that the cost of hands-on labs uh, kits was aligned with the value of getting to do hands-on experiments at home. And 72% of students agreed that the cost of the hands-on labs was aligned with the value of the materials in the kit. Now, before we wrap up, we did wanna dive in a little bit further into some of the common concerns around quality, um, uh, costs, and other things that prevent um, uh, faculty from bringing labs online. So three of the challenges that came up most frequently were recreating a hands-on lab experience, uh, the quality and rigor of the course materials, and the cost of the kits. Um, so 41% of instructors said recreating a hands-on lab experience was the biggest challenge when teaching an online lab. Um, but when we asked instructors, um, like I mentioned, whether using the hands-on lab kit was comparable to an in-person experience, 71% agreed. 26% um, of instructors uh, were concerned about the quality and rigor of the course materials. Um, but when we asked instructors um, uh, about um, the knowledge gains that students taking um, an online lab had, 89% of instructors said that using the hands-on lab kits gave students the opportunity to learn the knowledge and skills needed to pursue their course of study. Finally, um, as we mentioned, cost is a major concern um, but 72% of students said that the cost of the hands-on lab kit was aligned with the value of the materials in the kit. So what are our key takeaways from the uh, first annual lab report? Online learning is here to stay, and we really want to be able to embrace this with its, within STEM-related disciplines. And there is a way to really deliver an effective online lab course with the quality level of quality and rigor that students would experience in an on-campus lab. By incorporating a hands-on component, um, we can ensure students have a comparable experience to that of an in-person experience. Now, there are some risks to student learning when relying solely on virtual simulation. There can be an effective tool um, and beneficial for students to give them the ability to repeat, um, to really have a low stakes opportunity to dive into the science that they may be performing in a hands-on modality. And really, as institutions expand online courses and programs, um, they should provide students and instructors with the support and resources they need to deliver um, online courses effectively. And so with that, I'm gonna pass things over to Carl um, to share um, his experience in bringing his STEM courses online. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I approach this from my own perspective when I was looking at online and teaching online STEM courses. Um, and I've broken my parts down to, into four real key discussion topics. The first one is understand your learning goals. Um, I think we know from our face-to-face -face course sections that when you align the lab with the content objectives, students get more out of it. They get to see the science in life. 
in practice. And so designing online STEM labs is going to want to require that as well. My students have reported back to me through surveys I put to them every quarter that they really enjoyed actually seeing the science and the concepts live in action using their lab kits. I'd also make the point that less is more philosophy applies, especially online. You can do a lot of high value richness in the hands-on lab experiments um, and maybe supplement with a couple of virtual lab experiments. I teach chemistry, so most of what I do is hands-on, but you can do a nice complement of both hands-on and virtual learning uh, and then pacing out with the, the students in your course. I'm also adopt the warm demander uh, philosophy uh, of teaching. Uh, this was recently presented by uh, Zaretta Hammond in her Culture Responsive Teaching in the Brain book, but it's been known for a while. Uh, the warm demander pedagogy helps students build trust within the course, teaching self-discipline, supporting trial and error, understanding the dis discipline behind hard work and helping them believe in the impossible to achieve their dreams. So strict, but yet warm and flexible with students. It really goes a long way to supporting students as they navigate an online science course with online labs at home. Um, and part of that is helping students understand the pacing and the flow of the course. Online will move at a very different pace than face-to-face. -face. So you need to be accommodating and flexible with the students. The labs will take them a little bit longer. They are at home, but the richness is there. And that's another point, trust in the quality of the kits. There are a, a large number of labs and virtual simulations that you can use and employ in your class. So the richness is there and the quality is there. My students get test tubes and beakers, Erlenmeyer flasks, graduated cylinders. They do a variety of hands-on labs at home that complement practically one for one what we do on campus and our own labs. And that's how I designed the curriculum to kind of go one for one, step for step with our uh, on-campus counterparts. And then finally, the LTI integration with your learning management system is seamless with the science, science interactive cloud reporting system. And so you can go back and forth with the grades and reporting the students, giving feedback. So the richness is there for you as well to, supply, to, to use that. Next slide, please. Uh, know your audience is another one of part of these. I teach at a community college in Washington state on the Portland, Oregon border. Um, we are a large kind of urban area, but yet we have a large rural service population. Historically, community colleges also attract a large number of historically underrepresented students in higher education. So we really need to understand who we're serving and how we can serve them best. Um, you know, about two thirds of our students are part time. The average age of most of our students is over 24 years of age. Uh, most are living with or taking care of individuals. So flexibility in, in where they're learning and what they're doing really helps. And online STEM can offer that opportunity for these students. Um, a lot of them also leveled up in the economy during COVID. They took in higher positions or they veer we arrange child care, care schedules and whatnot. So they really need the opportunity to re-engage to get re-credentialing. Um, and community colleges, are they're coming us to us for jobs. Um, so we are a great uh, opportunity. We have great access. So we really wanna be able to support students as we can. I'd also say that there are secondary effects also for students doing labs at home. Uh, for low resourced individuals, for example, a, a, a parent or a sibling doing labs in the home, bring science into the home, it transfer, translates directly to the other people in that home. They may be able to use the equipment when the science is done, play with that and be more familiar and be more, and be more ready to jump into a science class on an on-campus experience. So there are all kinds of things that also offer uh, additional benefit just beyond the primary. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then in your course, foster a learning community. Learning is connected and learning is social. So design things within your course that help engage students. Um, a lot of it teach science labs do a pre-lab lecture. You can do that with the science interactive labs. You can go through the setup if you want with your students. You can talk them through step-by-step. Step. You can do a post-lab analysis after you grade and evaluate the labs that students have done for you. You could host weekly virtual office hours like I do, just for lab once a week. Students know they can pop in on a Thursday or a Friday whenever they're doing their labs. That you can support them as they're walking through that. It's really vital to a lot of our folks who've never experienced lab before, but you can be there with that warm demand or type of pedagogy. Um, or I also have a lab only discussion board in my course. Students are working on labs actively in every course module every week, and they have a discussion board. They can post and answer questions um, with each other. It could be a setup question or it could be what they do in a regular face to face class where they have a lab partner. And they meet before or after or during lab to discuss the lab stuff. Um, 
You can also provide a lot of feedback. You know, in online and hybrid modality, student feedback is critical and regular substantive interaction is a vital part of online learning. And in the Science Interactive Lab Cloud, students can report all of their data down to significant figures in units. Um, they have to do reflective analysis of their data, and then they can extend their data in analysis and synthesis types of questions. And you can provide feedback for all of that for your students. So there's the richness of tools to support students through these labs and again and authenticate that this is their work and this is their voice um, in the system and the lab kits have a, a lab kit code so it's single user single sign-on so each individual uh, is responsible for their work and it works really well uh, and i would say lastly too all of the things i've just talked about help students understand that you know learning comes with a struggle that's part of it so we embrace that and again the labs will take longer at home because we're not setting up the labs for them they are responsible for that. But they can also take the opportunity to go through those labs at their own pace, sometimes starting and stopping labs in different days around the work-life balance. Um, and again, helping understand that our on-campus students, some of them are two-hour labs and three-hour labs. So you can reasonably expect to spend at least two to three hours on a lab doing the setup, the data analysis, uh, and again, soup to nuts. Um, so again, helping your students understand that it's a little bit different online, but it supports their learning well, um, and the richness is absolutely there. Next slide, please. And then finally, challenge your notions of what's possible. Uh, I, I saw a question from Robert Killen in the Q&A about this. Um, help your colleagues, uh, you know, to move forward and to understand what online science is going to entail. Uh, teaching on its own is a very hard thing to do. Online and hybrid teaching especially takes a lot of study. Uh, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of evidence of what best practices are. So find those like-minded individuals. Uh, maybe find an instructional designer on your campus. Uh, seek professional development on your campus. Um, or work to promote that. Um, on my campus, we have a Quality Matters champion and the 2023 uh, Ron Lagan uh, Quality uh, Online Award winner, Dr. Kathy Chatfield. She's been an invaluable resource to me, as have all the instructional designers and coaches that work in our e-learning department. Um, so foster community practice on your own campus. Talk, collaborate, and then finally ask your students. There's a lot of student survey data and what's been presented today already. Ask your students. They'll know what they need, and then you can design resources to help them uh, be successful in your class. So, and also help your students model growth mindset, right? We all need to get into that growth mindset ability to learn and reach. So keep asking, keep reaching, keep, keep training. And I think that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, so before we jump into Q&A, and please, if you do have any questions for any of our panelists, you can add them to the Q&A. Um, we're going to talk uh, about how key strategies for delivering uh, STEM effectively online. So our first question for our panelists is, how can institutions and instructors adapt their teaching methods to cater to a diverse student population with varying needs and preferences? Um, do you wanna share some thoughts, Bethany? Yeah, I, I think one of the primary ways that, that we can really tackle this as a goal is to think about the different ways that you can support students and give them some choice in their learning, uh, especially when you're, you're talking about trying to onboard students to something that's new, like doing an online lab, whether it's hands-on or, or virtual. So you may give them instructions, for example, in different ways. You might use those materials in different ways and, and even create a video of yourself to model how to do it. And then if it's a hybrid class, for example, they have that before they come into class. But giving those options for kind of choice for how they approach the assignment, the other way to really cater to a diverse student population is to make sure that you have some opportunities for them to practice these things in low stakes ways with feedback. So instead of going right to that assessment where they might have some anxiety about utilizing new tools online as well as taking an online class, and that's on top of learning you know, new um, skills in the course itself, give them some small low stakes practice learning activities to kind of introduce them and help them ramp up with that crucial feedback. And that's also the good stuff of, I think of online teaching. So it gives you that good opportunity to work to guide students. So focus on that voice and choice and supporting students in multiple ways. But Carl, I'm sure you have lots of suggestions here too. Um, yeah, you really have to, to, to think hard about what you want to do in your class and how you want to engage students. Like I said, online and hybrid is a very special type of, of uh, modality. Uh, Eric Majure at Harvard says you can't put old wine in new bottles. So you really have to think about how you want to engage students in, in that online modality. Um, again, in, in learning, again, as I said, is social. 
um, and it's connected. And so the more opportunities you can get from those low stakes environments, the peer to peer, uh, the, the, the trial and error process to support that, that points of progress um, really goes a long way in the online type of modality. Okay. So next question, what resources and training opportunities should be made available to help instructors teaching online STEM courses? I know Carl, we talked about this. Can you share some of the resources that um, was available to faculty at Clark? Yeah, again, I'll say access to quality instructional design for each modality I think is critical. I think hybrid is probably the most challenging to design. And, and my, my colleagues, Dr. Kathy Chadwell would agree with me versus what you can do online. Um, you know, collaboration to me is, is just kind of the key. We don't have to work in the dark. We don't have to be the one off. And so find like-minded individuals, attend trainings like this. Um, Try to promote professional development at your campus, whether it's stipends or whether it's professional development opportunities, tenure, promotion, whatnot. Try to work it into the fabric of, and the ethos of your institution. Uh, for us, you know, we get faculty stipends. I'm the chair of the Faculty Excellence Award Committee. We have a foundation that gives us money for, to do this kind of a thing. So we're very fortunate in that aspect. But, you know, just encouraging people to get on that pathway of training and looking at how they can sign better online courses to engage your students, get them onto that path of more success and helps kind of address the equity gaps we have in our, in our courses. Uh, so we get fine communities of practice. We have one of those as well. We use a common canvas shell in our state. We all go in there and we share methods, we share materials, we talk about challenges and opportunities. Um, and it's a very uh, fantastic resource you know, within our state there. Um, and again, I'll go back to this again, growth mindset. We ask it for our students, we need to ask it of ourselves. You know? So keep asking, keep learning, right? Seeing what you can do to enhance that, uh, that model there, so. Yeah, and, and just to yeah. add one thing onto that, because I think, you know, we had a really good question uh, in the Q&A about, you know, having, you know, faculty seem hesitant to do this. How can you really get some faculty buy in and, you know, sway their fears and address that reluctance? I think a lot of it also, it, you know, not just it, it, absolutely what Carl said, supporting faculty, make sure that they have faculty training and development opportunities. But faculty also want to see some examples and what's possible. I know when I first started teaching online, and I've been already teaching face to face for many years. I just didn't have a mental model of what I could do online. Um, and there were some courses that were very difficult to think about. How would I do this online? I used to teach public speaking. How do you do that online? So, um, you know, to underscore something else that Carl said, that faculty mentoring and support or faculty learning communities, but show faculty what's possible. Sometimes there's just such a gap in our thinking and then support faculty in reaching those goals once they know how things can be re-envisioned for different modalities. Okay. So our next question, I think, actually addresses one uh, that uh, Pamela just asked in the Q&A. How should institutions approach the decision between offering purely online courses versus hybrid versus high flex style courses? I know, Bethany, you touched a little bit on all of those being considerations, um, primary, secondary, or tertiary among uh, folks working in online. Um, how should they look at that decision? Really good question. Let me very briefly give definitions for these just because they are defined differently at institutions. And I want to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. So purely online courses, I'm thinking about an asynchronous online environment. You do also have synchronous virtual. It's a purely online course, but it's a little bit different. Hybrid traditionally is a combination of face-to-face -face and asynchronous online learning. And then in a high flex course, although institutions have been defining this in just lots of different ways, it truly means that students enroll in one course and they have the option for every course section, whether or not they want to attend face-to-face -face in a synchronous way or in an asynchronous way. So let me start with HyFlex. As you can imagine, that, that's a lot more technology uh, that's involved in that. It's a higher burden for faculty. You're essentially teaching in at least two modalities at one time. So part of the, the decision-making actually goes into logistics as well. And what can that faculty member do? How can the institution support them? So sometimes what can be done? What is realistic to be done? Um, that might trump, for example, how, you know, what students are actually asking for in terms of enrollment. High Flex offers mm -hmm. uh, ultimate flexibility for students, but it's a really big ask from instructors. And so, you know, you may not have the, the quality of the course that you want there. So 
In terms of students, also look to see where those enrollment shifts are at your campus. If you see those asynchronous online sections filling first and you have to add additional flex, uh, sections, that's really a cue to you that your decision probably should be to have more fully online options versus those hybrid. Uh, you may also see though for students that are, you know, example, uh, freshmen, you know, freshman cohort, they may still be adjusting to taking online classes. They're adjusting to new college or university environment. They're adjusting to taking, you know, this uh, this course at a college level. Hybrid might be a better fit for them. So they have mm -hmm. some in-person time uh, with their professor. They can kind of really see them, you know, doing some of these labs in class. So it really comes down to context, the students, the faculty, also the logistics and the amount of resources that, that you have to really support this effort. And I would add that we surveyed our students to ask what they actually wanted and desired. We found our morning sections up till about noon or so, they wanted all face-to-face -face from most of their science and math courses. In the later afternoons, they wanted more flexibility. So we have lectures, uh, kind of online modalities or synchronous online, um, and then we have labs on campus for those students. And then, of course, I taught evenings uh, and, and weekends for the longest time. And those students after COVID have almost all but disappeared. So they want fully online and fully asynchronous to adapt to those. Um, and we have another question coming up that will address this, but we're seeing students looking for all types of available modalities. Um, I will say recently I listened to a podcast from Al Solano at the Continuous Learning Institute. I'm talking about high flex and they talked about hybrid courses as being a DJ where you have two turntables and you're mixing the music. High flex adds a third turntable to that. I think that an analogy is apt. Uh, there's a very large step up to do high flex and you have to be very intentional about uh, micing up everybody in the classroom and engaging your folks that are both virtual and, and in, in person. So uh, really look at the data. There's been a lot of data that's come out kind of post COVID about all of these modalities. And so really do yourself study, understand what's gonna work best for you, for your style of teaching uh, and your institution. Awesome. The next question, um, if attending on campus is an option for a student and Bethany, you touched a little bit on this, what should a student consider when choosing between an online course versus an on-campus course um, as part of their STEM program? Yeah, I think one of the things that students should be looking at is their own readiness for online learning. So yeah, to go back to that example, I think a lot of uh, freshmen who are, who are you know new to the campus, they may want to pursue more on-campus options first because then they're not adding that technology element on top of just getting a, you know adjusted to college life. But that being said, a lot of students right now that are matriculating from high school to college, they have a lot more online experience than, than students in previous years. So it really is about you know, knowing your own readiness for online learning. Um, it may also come down to the particular program um, or, or course that you're engaging in. So this is kind of knowing yourself as a student. If, for example, you know that you really need to be in the classroom because this is this is a topic that you know you want to um, see, you know, done live, you know, in a lab experiment, for example, and kind of get started that way. But then maybe as you mature on and, and your tenure grows at that institution, you're more comfortable taking online classes. The other consideration, of course, is flexibility, um, especially for, for returning adult undergraduates or new adult undergraduates. A lot of them have full-time jobs. A lot of traditional age undergraduates have full-time jobs. And so that flexibility is a prime consideration for them. So know how you learn, know what you're ready for, and know that you have the flexibility in most institutions to go back and forth between on campus and fully online options or even try out that hybrid option. And I, I'll jump in here and say our students are doing everything. They're taking online hybrids and face-to-face uh, -face on campus on their schedules, whatever they can do. Um, you know, there's a question of also of a full-time and part-time, and I would say I don't really consider it that way. I think two five credit classes is probably full-time for somebody working 25 to 30 hours a week, taking care of dependents, um, especially if they're low resource individuals. Um, so really you know, do what you can to, uh, to, to look at that. But again, we do know that they're doing this. They're shopping all over the place. I have students from all over the country taking my online uh, general and organic biochemistry courses. I have deployed service folks. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that I can encourage this. And I see mine as kind of the level one science in their pre-health professional pathways that will encourage them to come on campus to seek those upper division lab experiences like in anatomy and physiology and 
and microbiology, I saw that in the chat as well. So again, we're trying to throw a way to build STEM identity, to build capacity for these individuals so they can begin, as Bethany said, just kind of self-assess to see what that next step is gonna fit them the best, whether that's an online or a hybrid type of an experience. Um, but our students are doing it all. They're shopping everywhere they can at multiple institutions every quarter to get their units to transfer, to get to their degrees, because they want that job at the end. Yeah. Last question, and Carl, this one's for you. How should instructors think about virtual simulations versus hands-on labs? So um, when creating a lab kit or creating an experience for their students online, um, if they want to mix in some hands-on and some virtual, how should they approach these selections? Again, it comes down to your experience level and your learning outcomes. Um, you know, some virtual experiments can be very elegant to work with students. Um, and we've seen some of that technology kind of come to the forefront lately. Um, uh, but again, I'm always of the less is more. I would say more hands-on is what our students are asking for. So really try to build those hands-on experiences as much as you can. Uh, you can customize the science interactive kits as I've done to do most of that. I know in my biochemistry course, we do an enzyme kinetics where they take you know, in a face-to-face -face lab an enzyme and put it through a couple of the temperatures, a couple of pH ranges to see where the enzyme stops functioning. Virtually for an online student, they can actually look at that data because the intellectual piece of that is the analysis side on the back end, right? And then the closing the loop on protein structure and whatnot. So to me, that's a great virtual experiment that they don't actually have to do with their home versus we do a synthesis of esters lab where they did make different esters and esters are very fragrant. And so having that olfactory sensation of doing the experiment and the reporting on what they smell and what it sees and connecting it to the organic reaction, the biochemistry is a very important part of that. So again, figuring out where these opportunities exist within your curriculum set and making those experiences as rich as you can. And again, I less is more, right? Do more hands-on. You know, you don't even in every week and every module, but do the ones that you think are going to be just right for students to demonstrate the material that they're learning. Um, and that's kind of where you know, get the best bang for the buck. Um, and again, plus one, you know, as a scientist, experience STEM people, we're all experimentalists by trade. So try something, right? Reach out there, do a plus one. And I just see how it works and then add on to that experience or modify things, right? And go for it the next time. Uh, but don't be afraid to go out there and try that. Um, and so to those folks you know, trying to convince colleagues, talk about it, look at the data. There's tons of data now in online learning when it wasn't present probably when I started. So you have resources to actually look at build that community of practice and wrap your arms around trying some online science stuff. Well, thank you both for um, all of the great advice and guidance for instructors looking to move online. So we're going to dive into um, the questions um, that you, the audience, have provided. And still, if you would like to add more, please feel free to. So the first we have is from Carrie. Um, my biggest question is related to transferability of online lab courses. Is transferability as the same lab, of, of lab science courses on the rise? I, probably online lab courses on the rise. So Carl, you've got students from all over the place. I, I assume you run into this. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. Uh, some states are looking at this in earnest and some states are kind of just figuring out this on the fly. Um, for most of our students, of course, on a college transcript, it doesn't say your chemistry course was online or not. It says chemistry 101 or 201 and what was accomplished. And so most schools won't know it's an online. Um, I would say from a transferability and credit standpoint, my online labs, like I said before, they mimic our on-campus labs almost one for one. So in terms of the, the educational quality and the integrity of what students are doing um, and be able to move on in sequences, it's one for one. It's a compliment. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. But again, you need to talk to your regional transfer partners. Um, I talk with my nursing cohort here and my dental hygiene cohort here, two of our biggest pre-health professional programs. Um, I work with them. I've served on their tenure committees. They know my curriculum and they have absolutely no issues with what we're doing and how it's working for students. And we're bringing in a much more diverse pool of students to apply for their programs. So we're enriching their programs as well by doing online STEM courses. And we have a question from Rachel. Carl, that was really interested in about your lab Zoom. Do you do a pre-lab with that or is that really more student driven? Uh, again, it's instructor choice. You know, you can't be everywhere all of the time. So you want to really want to hit students, you know, where it's going to make the largest impact. If you want to do a pre-lab setup, I think most students actually like a pre-lab setup. So I would encourage you to find some way to do a short video, a 12 minutes or less, talking them through the major aspects of the lab, maybe showing them a setup, talking about the big intellectual pieces and the connections to the content itself. Um, students would actually love that. 
So I think for an upper division type of a course, doing kind of a post-lab analysis, kind of a post-mortem of how the lab went and what the conclusions were, or doing some kind of a digest of student analysis or student synthesis type of a question so they can also kind of see where people ended up at the end of the labs. There's all kinds of ways to engage in an online hybrid type of environment with the, the course itself, so. Okay, we have from Ruti. Um, uh, Carl, have you encountered students that do not work on their labs and fail the course due to that? And then I think for uh, both you and Bethany, any ideas, how do you encourage students um, throughout the course of an online course where you don't have that face-to-face -face interaction? Yeah, um, I, I, I don't, um, but I have very flexible due dates. Um, and again, as a warm demander, I'm constantly checking in with students. Um, I use kind of a, a token system for students who want extensions on assignments. That is, they can contact me. I don't have, I don't need to know what, why they don't need a couple more days. I can just check in that you have a couple more days um, and they'd be responsible for their labs themselves. Um, I do let them know that this is a lab transfer course and that the X number of lab hours is required by state and federal agencies for transfer. They need to complete so many labs and my course is designed to comply with that. Um, but again, online is very different than it is face to face where you're not seeing them. So you really have to be present. You need to give them constant feedback and constant tending of the garden to make it flourish. Um, and students appreciate that. And, and again, I use video announcements every week. Um, I can do video supplements in my grading, whether it's in the SI cloud or in Canvas for these students. And so there's all kinds of ways to engage and help students connect to their labs and close the loop and giving that feedback. Okay. Uh, next, um, how do you give feedback when the LMS only includes text? This is a chemistry specific question. How do you give feedback yeah, when the smart. LMS only includes text box comments? Um, what is your approach to math symbols, et cetera, um, in that grading sure. process? Sure. I mean, I, I use loom.com. It's a, it's a free web-based video recording system. So I can record videos and upload video links to students. I can easily cut that and paste it into a chat with a bit.ly link. So there's all kinds of ways you can do that. Um, virtual whiteboards with students on Zoom. I do that all the time as well. Where we can talk about the chemistry and put in those symbols. Um, there is a equation type editors in most LMSs. Um, I don't think it's built into the tool quite yet for SI Cloud, but that's an easy thing to implement there. You can copy and paste like text type links would probably show up just fine in those student types of comments. So uh, you could also require students to download the PDF of their actual lab reports and then dump those into a Canvas shell or whatever you're using. And then you can do all of those resources you want to with feedback and symbols and whatnot. So there's a variety of tools you can use to engage students. So you can use any or all of them, depends on the student's needs and, and where they are. Questions around academic integrity. Um, you know, how do you verify that students are performing the labs at home? And then how do you counter um, uh, websites like Course Hero and Chegg where students may be uploading, sharing answers to their labs? Sure, let me handle this one too. So <laughs> in the SI lab, students have to take pictures of their, of their experiments. You can actually see their actual experimental setups. And again, the lab kits that, that we use through Science Interactive have a single signer user code that registers their lab kit, right? It gets them their insurance that covers them and their placement chemicals. But the big deal is that it's a single sign on user. So every student has to be assigned an account in order to post and do their labs themselves. Um, and so really you are watching them go through their data. You can look at the data like you do with any turn in lab in a face-to-face -face class to see if the data is matched or it's copied somewhere else. Um, you can look at answers that they post to their analysis questions and see, is that taken off? Is that AI? You can do a quick AI search to see if it was generated by AI. But the labs are not plug and chug. They're actually in-depth, hands-on lab experiments, and they have to do analysis on these. And so you can know that student voice and you can see how they're reporting. And you know, once in a while, somebody gets tired and want to go to Google and copy and paste something in there. You can see that, you can track that, and you can give them supportive feedback to ask them what you really wanted to do. Perhaps you want to answer that differently, you know, encourage them down that path of self-discovery and actually applying what they've learned in those labs. So I, I have almost no issues with, with academic integrity around the quality of the labs and how students are actually navigating those labs. Um, and I have quite a few Zooms every week with students while they're doing their labs. So I get to see them in their space with their lab goggles on working with a setup or trying to figure out how to finish an experiment. Um, and those quick five, 10 minute Zooms with students, you know, looking at the kind of things also helps to ensure you know, the students are actually doing the labs and they want to do the labs at home. Students actually love these kits. It's one reason why the price tag on these kids is not really an issue for the students because they don't have to come to campus. They can do things at home and the kits are robust. They have tons of equipment. They have all the things that they need and they really enjoy 
doing these labs at home. They, they really do. That's the feedback I get anyway. So Bethany, I have a great one here from you for Loretta. What about student learning online? Um, what data has been gathered to demonstrate, um, you know, the the um, that course outcomes online are equivalent to those in an on-campus or a face-to-face -face course? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great question. I'm going to answer that a couple ways. Um, in general, we're still getting this question, is online learning in terms of, you know, quality and student outcomes, is that on par with face-to-face? -face? Thankfully, we've been studying this for decades. There's an entire website devoted to it. No significant difference. I think it's it's been taken over now by DETA. They manage it. So good thing to look up. It's got a ton of research there looking at the parity between outcomes. But the other thing to remember here is not all classes are equal, whether, whether you're talking about face-to-face -face classes or online classes. So I think some Sometimes we can, you know, hold up a single instance of an online class and say this really isn't high quality, but we don't do that face to face. So it's really important, I think, to make quality part of the conversation so that you know that when you're designing that class, when you're delivering it through your active teaching, you've already done everything that you can in terms of good pedagogy and design, supporting online students, aligning all of these materials with your assessments and whatnot. And that way you can really isolate the effect of the modality when it comes to student outcomes, and that's what you're really asking. So we do have some research on that, but I would also encourage all faculty and instructional designers as well, you can do this as action research or scholarship of teaching and learning, a SOTO project. Look to see in your own classes if those student learning outcomes are met. Try to see if you can do some research at your own institutions, doing a comparison between face-to-face -face versions of a lab and online versions of a lab. Again, though, holding constant things like good design, making sure the faculty that are teaching it are fully prepared for the modality that they're teaching in, really looking to see whether students are ready to take an online class and are supported in doing so. So those are all the factors that you really wanna control for to make sure you isolate those learning outcomes. So short answer, definitely there's parity between face-to-face -face and online. It really does need to be a high quality learning experience though, and really look to see if your own institutions can get some of this data as well. And Bethany, also for you from Stephanie, um, are there organizations or journals dedicated to online teaching, online labs, um, to that build a community um, around the greater challenge of bringing either science courses, courses in general, or labs online? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know of one specific to STEM. Carl, you might. Um, that's not my, my previous teaching area, unfortunately. So I'm learning a lot from, from everybody today. But uh, definitely there's a lot of good uh, books on online teaching. There's a lot of good resources um, on the QM website, for example. We have some PD related to teaching online, designing online courses. There's also a lot of open access information about teaching. Um, Oregon State, for example, they have a, a wonderful new set of online online teaching principles they came out with. And you'll find a lot of um, good articles about teaching online in a lot of the good journals, American Journal for Distance Education, um, Online Learning Journal, OLJ, STEM specific. Carl, I'm going to toss that one back to you. Yeah, no, I mean, in my discipline, we have the Journal of Chemical Education. And so you're kind of peppered in there with some online stuff. I know I published an article around COVID about learning communities and online engagement and STEM type of courses. So you can seek out those kinds of things. Um, there are quite a few um, open resources like what Humanizing Online is one of those or a consortium out of California. Um, there's another one I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but I think it's OCCL. Um, so there are all kinds of organizations out there that are looking at online engagement around this. Uh, for STEM specific stuff, it, honestly, there isn't, there, isn't, there isn't a lot. So as I've said, community of practices, finding like-minded individuals in your area or across the country or wherever uh, was probably one of your best bets to just share best practices and see what works. So. Awesome. Well, we are just about out of time. So I want to thank everyone so much for joining us today. We really appreciate um, your time this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Bethany. Thank you, Carl, both so much for sharing your experiences, for the, sharing the Chloe data. Um, we are so glad to have had you here with us today. If you are interested in learning more about our annual lab report, um, we're including here a QR code where you can access the full report. Um, and we are more than happy um, if you have any follow-up questions to answer any. Thank you all so much again. We appreciate your time and we look forward to hearing from you in the future.